Hi, Nikolay. Hi, Mehmet. Oh. Good to Hi. see you guys. Can you, hear me? you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you very well. Excellent, excellent, excellent. Glad to see you. So, how many people will be in this webinar? Um, so, basically, we have had from 55 to 250 uh, okay. people attending. Mostly so spinal know, surgeons. Mostly spinal and majority are trainees, actually. Trainees, okay. So, well, to talk more about for trainees, yes, okay. That is. Yep. Mehmet, can I no, actually, you are the moderator. You should do that. I'm staying on site. Please okay, manage. brilliant. Uh, um, dear just, friends, I are welcome you. Two more yeah. minutes. Okay, at the moment we have 38 participants and we are building. Um, uh, I welcome you to this. Um, WFNS Spine Committee and how, 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 uh, how many participants we have? At the moment, we have 40 now. We are just okay. growing, they're, they're coming. Yeah. So, uh, it's 41 now. So, okay. um, yeah, so um, I welcome you to this WFNS Spine Committee webinar. Um, and this is also supported by Pakistan Society of Neurosurgeons. Professor Zalili has been very kind in organizing these webinars mm -hmm. for a long time, and we are grateful to him. And today, we have a very distinguished speaker. Uh, Professor, Professor Konovolov, who's uh, from Russia, he's a world-famous neurosurgeon, has done a lot of interesting things. Just like his dad, he's uh, taken the torch forward and has done some amazing work. Uh, he's going to um, tell us, and you know, we requested him to keep it especially uh, for trainees so that they can learn from this and uh, you know, take it away with um, a lot of enthusiasm. And uh, I think, you know, welcome, uh, Nikolai. It's a pleasure to have you here. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Fantastic. Very good, very good. <laughs> Please start. Go. Yeah. Ah, we we ready to start. Okay. Hi, everybody. Yeah. So we need to, I need to put on my PowerPoint presentation. Yes. Uh, so. Um, and you must share the screen. Okay, I share the screen, and now uh, uh, we do. We so I'm going to talk about modern aspects of minimal invasive spinal surgery using interoperative CT and navigation systems. Uh, so I'm uh, pre present um, short to me. I'm Nikolai Konovalov. I'm a vice director of Bordenka Neurosurgical Institute in Moscow, uh, chairman of spinal department, also a Jan's board member, member of uh, spinal committee of FNS. And Bordenka Neurosurgical Institute, I can say, is one of the biggest neurosurgical institutes in Europe, for surely in Europe, I think one of the third in the world. We have 300 beds only for neurosurgery, 20 ORs. And the number of the surgeries that we're doing for a year is 10,000 surgeries only in neurosurgery. Um, one part of this um, big institute is the spinal surgery. And now I'm going to share my experience about using my minimum invasive technique um, treating some spinal problems. Uh, so first of all, I want to start with the, uh, the thing where we have a huge experience, more than 800, 800 50 uh, intermediate cord tumors. And I want to say that when you're treating intermediate cord tumors, you also have to use the principle of minim, minimal invasive surgery. Here you can see a tractography, for, uh, which is uh, which new, um, standard, um, new standard of examining of intermediate local tumors. And you, you can see now the quality of tractography, how tracks go around the tumor. Can you understand where the tumor is located? But now I want to say about, uh, for example, if we put the example of this cavernous malformation, which is located on the ventral part of the spinal cord. So you can see from the dorsal part, you see any, any changes. So you have to split the spinal cord using minimum invasive principles, go through the spinal cord, and on the opposite side of the spinal cord, you can, you can find this cavernous malformation, which have the episode of bleeding before, and the patients have some neurological problems, so we need to resect it. So you can, we can also, we use also interoperative angiography during um, cavernous malformation, but in real, it doesn't play any role in the tactic of the surgery. And uh, run a little bit forward, uh, and uh, we resect this malformation, uh, cavernous malformation totally. And um, you can see in front of it, 
uh, you can see in front of it, there will be an interesting thing. So the total malformation, total resection, you see big vessel which is in front. So the spinal cord total is split into two parts. And in front, we can see the vertebral artery. You can see it on our vertebral angiography. So the, after the surgery, after the surgery, you can see the patient, you see total removal of this, of this um, cavernous malformation. And the patient dying, dying, doing very well after the surgery, no neurological deficit and moving from the, our department in four or five days. So we can say if we follow the principle of minimum vessel surgery, we try not to damage around tissue, we get very nice results even in treatment into middle cord tumors. Another example of minimum invasive surgery is a dural fistula. And most of the dural fistula which we are doing in our institute, we do endovascular. But in this case, endovascular, our endovascular colleagues cannot close this fistula because of some pro problems. And we, uh, we need to do this by, uh, by the micro neurosurgery. So the first, uh, first thing is very difficult to find the correct level. We're using with ORM and navigation system. Then you open, then you open the, the, the dura and you see a lot of vessels and you really don't know which to coagulate, where is exactly the dura fistula. But you have preoperative angiography and also you, are, you can use interoperative, interoperative angiography and then you can see immediately where is the fistula are. So the first goal is to find the correct level, then the second goal to find the correct vessel. And then this, the, the procedure after this will be already very simple. As you can see, I'll forward a little bit it. Uh, the procedure is very simple. You just coagulate one, one vessel and cut it. And uh, if you, and cut it. So, but you need to find the correct vessel what to do. And after this, if you see uh, inter interoperative angiography, after this, you see that there's no, already uh, the fistula and the patients get, get much better, much, much, much better after the surgery than before, immediately. So more, as, uh, to conclude this, I can say the most dural fistulas are doing by you know, the endovascular surgeons, but when they cannot do this, you have to do some uh, special miss surgery to do them, uh, the, to correct this uh, malformation. Uh, so uh, surely the most minimal invasive way of treatment um, uh, to spinal tumors is radio surgery. In our institute, we have a huge center of radio surgery, which includes gamma knife, kiber knife, navalis, turbin, and all of these four machines are working um, uh, to help us to, in treatment of uh, uh, brain tumors and spinal tumors. For example, this example of metastatic lung cancer, um, which we didn't do, we, we didn't do any surgery for it. But we um, do radio surgery, and you see nice radio, radio, um, radio, nice MRI after the surgery, and good clinical results. So most used for intermedular cord tumors, um, uh, the radio surgery is good for metastasis because uh, you can know the histology before, and um, if you're sure that this is a metastasis, sometimes it's better not to do the surgeries; go to directly to the radio surgery. Surely we do. Uh, we have a special protocol to do the radio surgery. Uh, radio surgery uh, for extra medullary cord tumors, and one day I also can share it. Another way I can uh, want to tell you about principles of minimal invasive surgery for extra medullary cord tumors, like this principle as um, uh, Q-hole approach. So the approach for this tumor, as you can see, a huge meningioma of cranial vertebral junction, and the approach like exactly like 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 a size like a size of the tumor. Uh, I don't know what is this red lines happening. Um, uh, so you um, uh, see that the tumor, tumor is uh, very big and it's uh, exactly the size of the approach is similar like to the size of the tumor. In the most cases we do debulking before, but in this case we just try to remove the tumor in the same, in single piece. You can see how, how hard it's going out, but um, I don't know, do you see this uh, color lines on the screen? Okay, so you see the tumor was removed totally. And, but surely to start to do these cases, you know, you need, you need, uh, you see the small approach, um, no laminectomy, you need to be very experienced with open surgeries. So when you have a very experienced with open surgeries, uh, you uh, can do the same with misapproaches. I have one question. I have red lines on my slides. Do you see them or not? Yes, we do. Uh, so I don't know. It's not from me. Wow. It's not from me. Somebody who put it on, can you? Because there was also yellow line that turned it off. No, we didn't do that. Uh, so I don't know the reason. Yes, I see it for, for the first time, really. Mm -hmm. Okay, so something. Okay, this. 
Okay, better, 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 better. Yes. No. One more, one more line. One, one more. So we have to say thank you to somebody. Thank you. <laughs> okay, we go forward. So uh, and you see, so a small cut from lateral part, and also we can say that these approaches for the uh, extramedullary cord tumor is the future for their surgeries. And also before we think that for uh, some tumors which is uh, located in front. Uh, now I think it's better to go with me because you can go more lateral and um, uh, less stress the spinal cord. One more example of, uh, this is the patient after the surgery, as you can see, immediately activated and feels very good and uh, go in a very short term home. Um, this is another example of epidemoma of caudic vena. You see the big, rather big tumor. And we use um, uh, the technique which you use for the stenosis quadrant, uh, to muscle dilatator. Then we just drill uh, intraminal approach. And then we just uh, do the same like we do for the stenosis. We, rever we reverse our, our like a um, uh, Bernard Myers post over the top. We reverse our um, uh, tube and uh, the decompress other side. And then you open the uh, dura mater and you can remove, I say, or reproach at the same times like a tumor. Uh, so the tumor hardly go through the uh, hardly go through uh, the approach what we what we make and uh, the most uh, interesting thing is that it give a, a good great cost effect for the clinic because patients go out um, um, get up very fast and in one two days go home and just feel much better much better uh, uh, much faster returning to work. Uh, so uh, there's most minimal invasive method for. The neurative disease is now total uh, full endoscopic uh, procedures, which you can do is only a small tube with one instrument. I think everybody knows it. We have also a big experience in using this technique, but uh, my, my main thing that you, didn't need to, you don't need to go directly intralaminal, you also can go transforaminal, which is a different. And at the, when we start to do this, we start to work with Stotz, with um, Joymax, and develop this technique. We think that the results will be much, much maybe better than using the, the, the classic, classic techniques. And um, so this is the discriminations that we took out with this. And I'll show you uh, one film, uh, transfer amino approach. So main trick in this surgery, one of the main tricks in this surgery is uh, to, uh, to make a, a, a correct Mm, uh, correct position. So you, you see, you can see the deal. Uh, deal. You can see your endoscope is in. You find the sequester and you taking uh, taking it out. And here is the MRI before and after the uh, after the surgery. You can see totally more for disc herniation, and the cut is very very small. Uh, but com com comparing, comparing, uh, comparing our uh, so you can also do on the cervical level the same procedures we start to do on cervical level, but literature and comparing our results, we can say that it's a little bit less analgetic after them uh, after um, uh, the, on the first day of surgery or two days of surgery. Maybe the patients feel less local pain, but the, no, no long term results. According to the literature and according to our experience, the same, same rate of um, complications, same rate of um, disc recognition. Uh, so uh, I think uh, you can use both techniques, traditional microneurosurgery, which we do um, for, for the most of the cases still in the Institute because we don't have so much equipment for endoscopic, but we also do a lot of endoscopic surgeries. So this is, but the results, uh, long-term results are the same. So this is also the question for discussion, and there is a lot of now papers which publicate uh, the idea that the results are the same and what is the de future development of these techniques. One idea of developing a full endoscopic is to combine with, with, with the navigation system, because you, when you do a um, full endoscopic resection, you use a lot of fluora, and to increase um, the, the radiation on the um, uh, spinal team, you use navigation system, and then you play, can place your endoscope um, no, um, uh, already with, uh, with um, using navigation system, which make much much safe for the working uh, team. <clears throat> so now I um, uh, uh, spoke much much more about navigation systems and the interpretive uh, CTs. The most uh, the, uh, the history of it that navigation started to use in neurosurgery in the early 90s. In 1995, first transpedicular screw was put in with the navigation system. And um, now we have one of the most powerful machine for this, it's uh, Siemens Somatome Definition H. 
It's 128 the Spiro City, which is located in our operation room. And a very uh, useful thing that we have one machine for two operation rooms. It's located in the garage in, in the middle. And you can use it, move it to the uh, one part where the spinal surgeons are, uh, are working and for another part for brain surgeons. So in one part, uh, they're doing brain surgeons, put stimulators, and, uh, DB, do a DBS at the same time. And we use the same machine. Uh, then we uh, do examination for spinal surgeons to combine it with navigation system. And I'll show you some examples how we use it. For example, breast cancer, 53 years for male. So we decided to do palliative surgery. Uh, we just uh, do the fusion and uh, partial removal and then radiation, radiotherapy. And you can see her laying in the CT before the surgery. Um, before the surgery. And uh, here is this, uh, how we do the scan. So the table going inside the uh, CT, and CT moves on the table. The both going inside each other. Then we do the scanning. And then we transfer all automatically all data to a navigation system. And here, what, how we work already. So you can see that the surgeons, are, this is the detail of the screen. But I have a small video which I made for the educational courses. They were very primitive how the surgeon already working. He's also, he have to fill his hands. It's so for sure, but he looking only at the screen, where is his navigation tools are. But also I have to point out that there is no LED, there's no protection from the uh, X-ray, so which makes uh, the surgery much more easy. And you, but you always have to look on the X-rays, but you have to trust your hands because navigation, if, if you make mistakes, you, uh, you'll be responsible for it. So you have always um, feel the tissue understood they are in the bone and then you'll be very successful and this is the um, uh, principles how you put trans transcutaneous screws uh, transcutaneous screws and here at the end of the uh, one of the, um, uh, the entire when all the screws are implanted are implanted and this is the final uh, a final CT we can do this 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 quality of CT in, in, in immediately after the surgery already checking if the, all the screws is correct, all the decompression is, um, uh, did, did well, uh, all the structures are um, decompressed and you can uh, we check all the screws and um, uh, then we are sure that everything is okay and the number of reparation after this is coming less and less and less. Another example of a huge uh, hardoma of the cervical, you can see here this big hardoma. You know the hardoma is supposed to resect it with um, end block resection. So, and we first of all we do preoperative MRI. You see the size of the tumor. Then we do angi angiography. Then we do biopsy. Say that this is hardoma. And then we um, uh, then we do 3D model. And because it's a huge resection of the bones, and we prepare a special mesh which we can uh, put with the screws put inside when we resect the bone or using 3D modeling. And then we uh, do percutaneous tracheostomy, endoscopic gastrostomy, uh, then posterior approach, remove all posterior elements, fuse the cervical and not, not do C1, C2, and um, then C6 and C7, I think. Um, so um, uh, we put, um, uh, and then we do an anterior approach and um, uh, remove all the tumor in one block and block and see you can see the the, fi the final the final pictures uh, you can see that the construction is very long there's no connection with the bones of the head and the neck all is on the on all is instruments and surely to put all this construction in you need to use interoperative CT, interoperative navigation and ct because it's otherwise you can have a lot of complications um, another use of interoperative CT, uh, also we find out in navigation, even in interoperative CT, in correcting of sagittal balance. For example, this woman who was operated several times in different clinic, of mostly of the severe back pain uh, because of the uh, incorrect of sagittal balance. And um, uh, we, do, we do PCO on her. So you see how she walks very difficult before the surgery and um, in incorrect balance. And um, uh, during the surgery, we do PCO. And um, then uh, using the CT, we decided which, uh, uh, which degree we need to correct the schedule balance to put her in, in correct position. So you can, see, you can see the plan of the surgery. And um, uh, after we do the PCO, then we uh, calculate the degree um, of correction using the, the, the CT. I can tell you that we do a lot of the surgeries but we do some, and it's very nice when you can see on uh, the, uh, in one piece um, degree of your correction. 
and um, uh, and you can you can calculate it according to some articles. According to, to some articles, uh, the correction uh, comparing to standard to standard to standard films is about difference about in four degrees. So it's quite quite accurate. So going forward, I have to say we have some experience using. First of all, we have experience of robot um, uh, robots in spinal surgery. Now it's very popular, but we have first experience in uh, 2009. At this time, we don't have any interoperative CT, so we work with the CT. But, and so it was very long procedure and really we don't like it because um, uh, you need to first to put install the robot then you have to um, um, combine with the uh, preoperative CT and then um, uh, if you make some dislocation then you can use it uh, but we still perform some cases with this and um, uh, it's uh, you see percutaneous putting it with the screws using the robot and uh, some also we did some fusions like a golif a golif techniques but now we still start to stop to do this but our experience of using the robot if it is you surely you can use it alone you need to use it also only with the ct my, my main key to use all the navigation systems um, uh, you have need to have a interoperative ct or interoperative forearm or something like this. Because if you use preoperative CT, if you do decompression or um, destruction, or you put the cage in, you immediately, um, uh, your navigation system will be wrong. So the most important thing, because we now have two machines in the Institute, it's one of them, it's a uh, big Siemens, which is installed last years. And before we have um, OR, which was installed in uh, 2013. So we have whatever the, seven years of experience of using ORM and comparing with the Siemens, I can say uh, uh, surely the quality of the pictures of the Siemens is, is, is better. But ORM is much faster. And sometimes during your surgeries, you need to re, uh, re, uh, re, re registrate it four or five times. And solely with ORM, it's less dose of radiation and the fast of registration five to five seconds. So uh, in really, we can say that is navigation in real time. If I feel that the navigation is not accurate, I immediately go out for one minute, we rescan and go automatically all the data go to the navigation system. And then we are really navigating in real time. So this making this small, easy, uh, lightest machines much more useful than big machines, because I think it's the future. You don't need so huge quality of the pictures during the surgery like on Siemens, but it's more than enough to have you know, or arm or uh, fast uh, scanning machine or uh, that you can do um, more time re-navigation um, re and um, do the quality of the surgery is better. And according to the literature and to the data, if you're using navigation and if you're using um, uh, machine uh, interoperative CT, the quality of your instrumentation is much better, coming to 99% of correction of putting of the screws. Surely nowadays we try to stop to put the screws, especially for the stenosis. We now the tremendously changed because in the previous years, five, four years ago, we tried to screw everything. Now we uh, try to not screw, not to do the uh, screwing. We try to prevent instability and do micro decompression, do micro decompression, and um, try not um, to damage uh, bone structures. To take only the uh, the part inside the canal to increase the canal and not to fuse them. And we do one, two, three, four levels micro decompressions from like all over the top and start uh, stop um, uh, to do the diffusions. And we really we changed our data and now now most um, uh, surgeries for the stenosis on only micro decompression without any fusion. Surely there are some indications where you need uh, to fuse if you have spondylolisthesis more than five or two millimeters, or you have mobility than three, four millimeters, or angel, uh, uh, angel of um, facets more than 50 degrees, um, high, uh, high disc, uh, <clears throat> or high pelvic index, you need to think about the fusion. But we try to avoid it all the time. Uh, and so here is an interesting um, uh, video. Uh, and um, we, we make it by ourselves. It's a new, our, um, uh, we try to make a digital uh, atlas of spinal 
problems on a normal spine. This is a Russian um, animation, which we make in our institute in my department. And you can see here that it will be very interesting. I can send to all the students or to all the participants. Here you can see on 3D films, main principles of micro decompression during stenosis without any fusion. And um, you can see the quality of animation that Russian IT guys do. And then uh, in the future, we want to develop and make the whole catalog of um, uh, the surgeries you know, which you can um, show to the students or to the patients you know, to understand them you know, how one surgeon is or one surgery is passing. Surely you can combine with the real videos and it will be much nicer. I make it a little bit shorter so it's look like this and uh, this is the steps of the surgery and you see the quality of the, uh, of the picture and the quality of um, uh, the 3D reconstruction of the bone of all the structures is very very high. So I think we, we together we can go forward and develop this atlas. Um, so also important thing what you can use navigation you can navigate your cage uh, so you can put the correct angle and it's much faster and um, uh, it's very, very easy. Surely experienced surgeons doesn't need any navigation to put the cage but it's very also nice when you can navigate cages for putting the screws you use uh, percutaneous screws you put the same CD needle um, uh, and um, verto, verto needle so you can see from the ski, uh, skin or where your needle will go and where it will uh, go inside the pedicle and where will be the end of it. And so you can put uh, the position of your screws in very um, correct position. Another technique we will develop uh, is, of, um, of, is direct lateral, lateral interbody fusion. Also using the navigation system, for example, this case of spondylolisthesis. We put the patient um, on uh, lateral position. When with the narrow monitoring, we find the root, uh, put the retractor, and then already we use the navigation system to put the cage. So also we don't use any flora. We use also only with the arm to put this big cage from lateral part, make um, make non-decompression, um, uh, uh, make a decompression. We, we, we're not opening the spinal canal, only do the decompression with the distracting and put, putting the correct in correct, uh, no, the correct position of the uh, ver uh, vertebras. And um, after this, we reverse the patient and or using also navigation system, put four screws um, uh, from the back, for example. In this case, there's some more. But now we compare the results you know, with a uh, posterior approach or lateral approach. And according to our results, according to literature results, long term results are also. Uh, also the same. Those both techniques of putting the cages from the um, uh, lateral part or putting the cages from the back part to our experience and the experience of the literature is about the same techniques. Um, one interesting thing, for example, to doing cervical cases, now we use navigation drill. And um, uh, how it looks like uh, navigation drill. This is the case when we do laminectomy and we need to fuse the spine and we use navigating drill. So it's very easy to put the screws using navigating drill. You just drill your direction, you can see the, the vertebral artery, you can see the nerve root, and you drill in the correct way with the navigation drill, and then you just tap and put the screw in. It's much, much faster than traditional things. <clears throat> now for all cervical cases, we use navigation, especially we use navigating drill. So it's, it's, it's making your surgery much safer, much faster, and much accurate. Surely after this, we do control, x-ray, uh, control, um, uh, control, um, uh, of CT and check all the if all screws are okay. But you see this navigating drill, it's very easy. You so you don't uh, it's, um, uh, and also when you're drilling, you don't move the bones much, and so you don't disturb your navigation. And you are correct with your navigation. Uh, so also for biopsy of, for example, the cervical level biopsy, uh, it's very difficult to do without the navigation. I know that this is not this is a gemangioma uh, of T1 level. It's also it's better to put use the navigation intraoperative CT to put your um, to put your um, because without the navigation you can uh, without the intraoperative CT you can see how much cement you can put on in because on the, the fluoride you don't see T1 uh, so uh, with the navigation you put the, the needle exactly transpedicular in 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 the, uh, the vertebral uh, body of TH1. And then you correct your position of your needle using the CT. And then you put the cement and immediately can see because the machine is very fast, how much uh, enough cement you put to uh, embolize uh, this um, gemangioma. You see nice results. Also another thing, cervical level, for example, biopsy of the tumor. It's very difficult to do with an interoperative navigation in CT because you are very near the spinal cord. 
And here you can all also put a tube exactly in the tumor and even you can try to resect it a little part using the, uh, some rongers. Uh, so you can see the biopsy and after this biopsy, we don't need to do the surgery. We can pass out this additional treatment. Uh, so gun, interesting case, last case, what I'm going to show you, it's gun, uh, gun, um, uh, gunshot and a lot of small bullets inside the spinal and, and spinal, spinal canal. Surely if you do, and you can do misapproach for this because all the small parts of bullets you can navigate with navigation seals, go directly to this and remove it without not damaging the nerve root. So in the results, I'm, I'm, I think it will be better with this. So in my conclusions, I'm really finishing half an hour of talk. And the middle and interoperative um, navigation systems and, uh, and the operative, interoperative CT uh, can be used in all spinal lesions. Uh, reduce radiation experience on the surgeons and surgical team. It's very important. It's real-time navigation. So you can navigate with, with fast machines very, or very often and stay in real-time navigation. Uh, very important control of the, of the compression. You don't need any pre-planning. Uh, you can you start to use your planning only um, directly in the surgeries. Post-operative CT control reduce um, the time of um, reoperations for, uh, for big numbers. Uh, decrease the surgical time, increase accuracy of surgical procedures, technologies, the technology is surgical supplement, not for uh, substitutes of the uh, skills of the surgeons. And I, feel, I think the future will be navigation um, of, in the spinal cord, spinal cord tumors. Thank you very much. Thank you. I'm right on time, 30 minutes. Yes, thank you. Uh, where is Salman? <laughs> Salman, are you there? Okay, I turn off. So I need now to turn uh, to, how can I go? Sal I think Salman has disappeared. Um, so uh, it was re really very uh, explanatory uh, lecture. Uh, we have some questions. You can, you can still. I, I want to, I want to go to, to video, then you can see me. Uh, so uh, you see me now? You see my screen? Uh, Yes. What I have to do uh, is this. Uh, uh, your, your presentation can stay on the background. Oh, no, okay, but I want to put my picture <laughs> myself. You don't see okay. me, yes? Okay, I can make it uh, view options. Ah, okay, I think here. You can turn to, to, yes, turn on the camera. Doesn't matter. Okay. Uh, the question is, uh, uh, how do you close the dura during endoscopic surgery, and how do you treat CSF leakage after surgery if if it happens? Yeah. Uh, the, if if damage, we don't close it. We don't close it uh, because the the, impro the approach is very very small. The approach is very small, so if you have to um, uh, damage the dura, you just take your endoscope off, and that's it. I just now, I just came from the surgery now. There was uh, the guy was operating in Saint Petersburg in another city, and he have no results after endoscopic intravaminal surgery. Now we do a reoperation on him, and when we open, my, my assistant opened it. He was very interesting. They see that uh, there was a, a damage of the dura. The nephrod was inside the, uh, the wound, was inside the wound, and, um, uh, and, um, uh, and uh, there was no leakage of, uh, there was no uh, leak, uh, leakage of liquor because the wound is very small. So if you damage the dura during the endoscopic surgery, you just um, take my endoscope off and that's it. You see okay. my picture or you see still my screen? Yeah, you, we don't you see, see your what? screen now. I shot your screen. You see me, yes? Okay. okay, thank you. you see fine. Me. Okay, good. good. I'm happy. Um, another question is that uh, do you use navigation and monitoring in all spine cases? Yeah, in, uh, now I use Flora very, very rare. I don't use, I use uh, navigation in most of the cases. If I need to put screws, I use navigation because I have Flora only like on um, staying, um, I have two operation rooms. And then um, uh, we, we use three, when, uh, so in two of them is CT, and one is OR. So in most of the cases we use um, uh, we use um, navigation. 
Surely I do some cases in private clinics where they don't have, when they don't have OR, but they do the same with the fluoro. The speed for me is about the same and the accuracy. But for the, for the surgeons who are just starting, for my fellows, I think using of the navigation system is very important. But surely they have, first of all, learned an anatom anatomical part and anatomical landmarks, how to put the screws. But then nowadays, all of them putting, for example, the screws using the navigation. And for me, it's very easy to control them, the quality of putting of the screws using interoperative CT. So I think this is very important part. What about monitoring? Do you use monitoring in every case? No, we use the narrow monitoring obligatory for intermedial cord tumors and use the narrow monitoring uh, for some extramedial cord tumors, ventral one. In other case, we don't use monitoring. <clears throat> in deformities, what about deformities? We, do, we don't correct a lot of deformities. We are neurosurgeons. Okay. So what I show you, this is kyphosis, sagittal balance. No, we don't do scoliosis. We don't okay. do scoliosis. For deformities, we, do, we, we can do this. We, we have a very strong neurophysiological de um, uh, department, and we do D waves, we do everything. But if we need it, we just immediately call them and they support us. Okay. What, another question uh, is asking this how do you measure the sagittal balance during surgery paraoperatively? You know, I have I have a young guy. Uh, personally, me, I don't do this. I have a young generation who know, know how to correct them. They have all the figures, have all these uh, modern um, computer um, computers, and they they they, they just really involved in it. Personally, me, I just say me how how much which niche. I do the surgery. They say which angle you need to correct, then to be in correct position. And so this is it. This, this, this it. Yeah, I can give an answer. Uh, yeah. Okay, I will do it. Yeah, the, I think Salman is muted. Oh, where is Salman? Salman, where are you? Um, another question is the, um, uh, probably in addition to that sagittal balance uh, uh, correction level uh, during surgery, a uh, new trend is to use pre-bent rods. Yeah. Actually, you can uh, measure how much correction you, you will make. And... Uh, pre-bent rods. Yes. With the pre-bent rods, you can make it better, better way. No, for, for sure. I, I, I told you, no, we are more near a surgical center. We don't have huge experience in correction of the sagittal balance. More, and so we do, we do this if, if the people come to us, but we have very strong um, partners, um, in orthopedic partners in the, uh, we have, this is Institute of Neurosurgery, Central, we also have Central Institute of Orthopedic Surgeons. If I have some for difficult deformities, I send to them and they're doing, doing them each day. So for them, they're very used to it. For us, our more, most is micro decompressions, microsurgery, tumors, um, degenerative disease. But deformities, we do them, but not too much. Not too much. Because in, really in the economic, in the, in the economic part, we can't install a lot of screws you know, because of the economic part. We do less, less constants. OK. Mm -hmm. Okay, I'm back actually. Yeah, sorry, I, I got unmuted by mistake. Anyway, so uh, there are a couple of things that, uh, because there are actually, there's a limit of 100 people, so there are many who couldn't connect, and some of them are messaging me for, with questions, and they're seeing it with somebody else's Hello. phone. Uh, can, you, can you hear me, Nikolai? Yeah, I hear you. Yeah, so the, the, the couple of questions that they've asked is, are, what specific precautions you need to take uh, when you do uh, you when you do a spin with O arm, and after that you're operating, if the patient moves while you're pushing or when using the drill, uh, what, your accuracy goes up. So, is there any special precautions that you take? Yes, well, um, you know, there's well, very easy. Uh, you have um, you have your instruments, and you, if you see that your instruments in not correct position uh, on the navigation, if you you put your instrument to the bone. As it's already under the bone or inside the bone, you have to renavigate. Re re so the most thing is not the picture, it's your feelings and your, what you see in your feelings. If you see that there's some mistake between navigation and, um, uh, and uh, your feelings and your idea, 
better renavigate. Re and why I like to, for example, work more with the arm because renavigation is one minute. It's much very fast. If I have some problems with the Siemens, it's long time, longer time. You have, um, you can do four times big CT during the surgery, spinal surgery. But with the arm, I can do five, six times during the surgery, and it's very fast and um, very safe. And what about the levels? For example, dorsal spine, when you're spinning, do you hold the uh, breath or do you hold the respiration when you're spinning to make sure there is no, no. Uh, problems no. afterwards? We don't, we, don't do, we don't do this, it's okay. Uh, and then, uh, there's also some good idea, for example, if I do several, several level, level fusions, for example, screws cages, screws cages, I go from the upper level, I, my, my um, frame is on the bottom, and I go to the upper level, put upper screws, then cage upper screws cage. So I just distract um, from the upper part. So I don't need to um, uh, recalibrate after each procedure. So we can do in one shot, if it's good, and if, if we are lucky, we can do in one shot, three, four levels, decompression and fusion without any renovation. But if we see some mistakes, then we do this. Okay, another question was regarding your closure. Do you, what specific thing do you use for your closure when you're doing MIS, for example, C-spine and you get a leak? Is there any specific closure, yeah. eclipse yeah. or anything? Six zero, six, zero, um, uh, six zero sutures. And we also use Tahakom and, and glue. Uh, and so, for example, if, I'm, if I, we have, uh, we have a lot of problems because sometimes I have, um, uh, removing big tumors which is um, uh, the damage all dura and then we just do for example we do try to close the dura or put uh, some synthetic dura over it then we put tahakom glue and tahakom the sandwich and in the closing of miss of miss we use um, uh, suturing um, with a um, uh, microsurgical technique with six zero sutures and then we put tahakom that's it okay uh, what about um, there was when you're doing over the top um, uh, you're showing the over, over the top MIS decompression. Uh, is there any specific drill you use that uh, inhibits the problem with dural uh, tear or something? This drill I show to you, we don't use it anymore. We use a long, long uh, diamond drill, long um, two or three millimeters ball diamond drill. The, the key, the key to the over the top approach is to drill bottom part of the uh, spinal process. When you do a lateral part, then you drill the bottom part of spinal process, make a space for you to go on the up opposite side and drill as much bone as, as, as you can from the bottom part of spinal process. And then you can easily, uh, there will be space between dura and, um, uh, and um, uh, the bone and you reverse the patient, you reverse the patient a little bit and then reverse your tube and go on the opposite side. And then you see the same like a, lam a laminectomy, but a little bit from the side. So uh, the, the key for me is drill one, the bottom of the spinal process. One yes. related question. If you do not uh, close the dura in most of the instances, you said so. No, for, it's, for, it's for the endoscopic cases. We can't for the endoscopic it. cases. Mm -hmm. Do you see any pseudomeningocell? It's, it can be. Mm. It can be. Not much, but it can be. But because, because we don't, we, we, we don't um, cut the muscles, we only puncture it, the muscles prevent it. So there is no approach really. There is like, they can be a little bit around it, but there's a big, all the tissue, uh, because the tissue is not, so in the most cases it's, um, it's like this. But and cell is, is, if it doesn't cause any problem, it's nothing. Okay, there is another question regarding the lateral approach that you showed putting in cages laterally. Uh, uh, what is your complication rate uh, regarding weakness in the thigh in these patients? The, the same as in literature, but now I'm now, now the same as in literature nowadays, for example, because when I start to do these techniques, I prefer to do everything from posterior. For me, it's much, much faster to put the tube, to take the uh, facet off, two minutes to put the cage. I think the, uh, this, the same level of correction will be the same correction and to put, uh, the, put every, do everything from behind. It's my experience. I prefer now to do this. Because really, in the cases of doing a lateral approach, there's a lot of food drop after the surgery and some complications. It's the same for the literature. But for me, what, like uh, in, in everyday life, I prefer to do, um, uh, for example, like if I do the discrimination, I prefer to do microsurgery with the tube. 
it's much faster and we, I'll be 100% sure that I did everything correct because I see all, all the details. In the endoscope, you don't see all the picture. You, you feel that you do this, but it's different from micro and I think the results are the same. For me, it's better to go um, with the microsurgery technique for disc herniation. And the same for the, if I need to do the fusion, I do from posterior, I uh, take the biggest cage as I can. Uh, and I think that the, the, um, it's no, no big advantages um, uh, to doing a lateral approach. I think it's a little bit make the time of the surgery a little bit longer. Okay, and what about, have you tried the oblique approach trying to avoid this complication? Uh, we only want to do this, um, this approach that I show you. Okay, all right, okay. And where do you see the future of uh, MIS uh, surgery itself? I think to do um, um, less fusion, less fusion, uh, which uh, now we see much better results really on our patients, especially in old people, for the uh, decompression on multi levels, uh, less screws. Um, and uh, to uh, the future, I don't know. This is, is very difficult. If you know the future, I will be ready to start to do this. But I think the navigate, the navigate positioning of the positioning of your cut. Uh, minimize the cut. Um, don't do this too minimal because if you do too minimal, you don't reach your goal. You don't decompress well. You uh, don't reach your um, don't re if you you make one centimeter small cut, but you don't do the good nerve decompression. You don't reach good results, and uh, so you have to not to be too minimal and not to be too aggressive. You have to find the gold middle of it. I think this is the future. Okay, and what about uh, robotic surgery? You know, you touched it, but the question is, do you think robots with their accuracy will take over um, the medical schools that we are putting in at the moment? And do you think their accuracy is going to get better and we will have less complications with robotic surgery? I'm following, I'm following this um, subject where, because we start, as I told you, to work with the robot. And uh, now I think there's no the, the evidence base that, free, uh, that in, uh, putting the screws with the navigation system um, no, with freehand navigation system or robotic navigation system that does give any clinical results. Because the accuracy, more surely, the robot may be more accurate for one, two millimeter, but it doesn't play a role of putting, putting the screws. I think well, the accuracy with putting the navigation system is the same with the robot. A robot only show you the, uh, the way, uh, the, um, the guide where you can to drill. But it's not so important, um, I think, but because I know, know all the machines like Metronic also make a robot, um, uh, brain lab making a robot. Brain lab robot is only the hand that can position yeah. your trajectory of, of, your, of your drilling. I, I think there's no big advantages, but there also no, was not big advantages when we start to use first navigation uh, systems very, very long time ago. No, when we bought the first station, station uh, Station 7, I think, it was very difficult to use it and we see don't any usage of it. Now we didn't, don't do any surgery without the navigation. So we need to be in the step of developing and then when the future will come, we'll be in, not out. So is, are there any surgeries in which you won't use um, uh, navigation? Any no, kind of surgeries? We use, we use it everywhere. We, we, uh, most thing what I love it is I have less radiation. I don't, um, I don't radiate myself and I don't put the lead. I put the lead on the lead protection only in the case when I put cement in. That's it. And I hate to put okay. the lead. Okay, I think there's, uh, there are two last questions here. One is regarding, uh, you know, you said that you leave the door open and you just use the triple layer closure. Um, it, the question is, doesn't the patient have low pressure headaches afterwards? No, sorry? You if know, when, we, when you have CSF leak and you repair and post-operatively, do they have low pressure headaches? No, um, no, 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 no. Like, 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 like removing all the, all the tumors. Um, um, no, the headache uh, becomes when you have a block of the, um, of the circulation of the liquor. For example, if an, uh, uh, a chiari formation or like a big tumor on the cervical level. And when you take this um, uh, compression off, and then um, uh, the, the, before the patient starts to build, build, sometimes it have a headache. But no, if you damage the dura, if you open the dura for the extramedullary cord, intramedullary cord tumor, never headaches after the surgery. Okay, and the, there's a last question. What about the developing countries? Can they afford this price of this, um, uh, all this OARM and this hi-fi stuff that you're showing? And is it really worth it? 
people spending all that money in, in the institution like this? I can say that I, for example, I do the surgeries, for example, in different uh, position when I do in private clinic, we don't have any OR there and they do the same levels of surgeries only using the classic fluoro. Uh, surely there is some advantages of this technology. They are, they are very expensive, like it's, it's 100%. And the use have to use um, uh, it's exp uh, make more um, expensive your surgery, but we have good uh, government support. For example, now the uh, I think we're going to buy our arm, second arm, new version of arm, and if government supports you, surely it's not for the private clinic because for private you can't um, uh, get money from it, but for government clinic if you go um, uh, work a lot, I think it is the future. And uh, really, really, if you, the main key to um, use the navigation is to use it all the time. If you're using it only for the difficult cases, then um, you, you, because there's a lot of mistakes in navigation, there's a lot of tricks, you have to learn on simple cases and then you can switch to difficult cases. Because for example, your team, if you to put navigation in only in difficult cases, are not used to use with this. Our nurses already know how to do or put all this stuff, for which case to open, which frame to give us, to clear all the spheres, and they know everything. They know how to register the instruments, and it's really, it's really you know, working very, 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 uh, very fast now. So, but if you have, if you have to do this every day, Salman, okay, so, yes, I can make yes, a comment on that question. Sure. Uh, actually, the minimally invasive surgeries have mainly three uh, disadvantage. First one is the basic instruments are quite expensive. Yes. Second, the training time is, uh, is a steep. Actually, you must uh, get a good training on that. Third thing, uh, you probably are getting more x-rays to, to yourself yeah. by using uh, navigate, even with navigations. Uh, you, for instance, in CT scans, if you are do doing intraoperative CT scans, you get too much uh, X-ray there. You must be out. Yeah, we're, all, we're always out. We're always out. Yeah. Uh, I think but so. but the, the advantages, the main advantage is that you can make even a day surgery uh, very uh, uh, restricted duration of hospital stays you can provide. Patients are more comfortable after surgery. And third thing is less infection you are having. The, it is, there are very nice series that are showing uh, in the outcomes, they are having uh, less infection rates. These are the main advantages and disadvantages. You then will decide uh, according to your budget, and to your personal uh, other things, uh, whether you have to start a minimally invasive surgery or not. And also I can say that to start minimally invasive surgery, you have very experience in regular surgery. After when you uh, have a big experience in regular surgery, then you can go minimally invasive, not at the beginning. You have to start with the regular surgery at the yeah. beginning. Another the last... thing, I think uh, for the training, you need, Almost always, you need some cadaver dissections yeah, or cadaver applications of minimally invasive surgeries. Otherwise, mm -hmm. it's the, the learning during the learning time, you can make too A many of mistakes. Mm -hmm. And then you, you will get frustrated and leave all the things out. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah, I think the other thing about learning curve is that, you know, for there's learning curve for your basic um, um, surgical skills and there's learning curve for MIS and how to make sure that you don't cause complications. And then obviously there's a learning curve for um, navigation. So all these learning curves have to be taken in, into account. And probably the best thing is to spend some time with a mentor somewhere or probably in a center where lots of these surgeries are happening if you want to uh, be very good at it and you want to make sure you don't cause problems to your patients whenever you start doing that. Uh, uh, Nicola, you, you want to give last comments and then you get Mama to say a few things and we wrap up? Yeah, I want to thank you for inviting me because it's my first Zoom, uh, Zoom lecture after the starting of COVID and I really think it's the future it will be in this um, Zoom lectures because 
it's really I don't need to fly to anywhere. I just get <laughs> operation room and I now can go back to my patients. And I think the level of the communication is very high. It's very interesting. And I see there's a lot of participants, about 100 participants. And I'm very happy that they hear me. I'm very happy to share our experience. And I think the future, surely it's very nice to meet together and just um, be in the meetings. But I think um, it will be less and less But um, in the future. But this way of conversation, I think, is not so bad. It's not so bad. It's very easy to the people to um, go, go inside of it. They don't need to buy the tickets. They don't need to fly. They can just turn on their computer. It's a very cheap way to get the information. And we can uh, very um, glad to share this. Thank you very much, everybody. Uh, I thank you, Nikolai. It was a really very, very attractive uh, presentation and lectures. Uh, although uh, this type of uh, meeting, webinar meetings, mm -hmm. are quite uh, successful and we are probably at somewhat at least recovering uh, from our anxiety and uh, lack of motiv motivation uh, in those uh, COVID-19 uh, outbreaks. Uh, but uh, we are humans and then we cannot do it this way. I think at the end we must shake hands, we okay. must drink something, and we must go to dinner. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, but uh, I am very uh, grateful for your uh, lectures and also for uh, contributions of Salman. Thank you, everybody, for joining us and becoming with us. Thank you very much, Mahfa. Thank, Thank you. Goodbye. Thank you, everyone. It was wonderful. Thank you, Mehmet, for organizing it. Thank See you, you Nikolai, soon. Bye-bye. Thank you. Okay, bye-bye.